Welcome to the Educause Rising Voices podcast, where we amplify the voices of young professionals in higher education. My name is Sarah Buska, and I'm joined by the amazing Wes Johnson. Thank you. All right. (laughs) (laughs) And we're your co-hosts for the show. Uh, We're members and friends of the Educause Young Professionals Advisory Committee, also known as YPAC. We are so excited today. Um, We have incredible guests on the show. Looking forward to introducing Susan Grajek and Joseph Cottle to talk about the Educause Top 10. So before we dive in, we love to ask our guests just a few questions to first introduce yourself, your name, bio, maybe your position. And then we also ask you what your superpower is. So Susan, would you be willing to kick us off and introduce yourself? I would be happy to. I'm Susan Grajek, the Educa's Vice President for Partnerships, Communities, and Research. I've been with Educause for a little over 13 years, uh, and my role has evolved. But really throughout that time, I've been responsible for the Top 10 project, which um, we recently renamed from the Top 10 IT Issues. And, uh, and, and it really is just about my favorite thing to do at Educause because it is a thing that I do every year and I can say, oh, look, look what, look what we did. And I also get to do it with the community. And so yeah. I learn an awful lot and, and, and I really enjoy that. Um, before I came to Educause, I was at Yale University for over 25 years. Uh, and I was, I was, you know, in a variety of positions, um, always, always, you know, in technology um, throughout the campus. I started off in the central campus in academic computing, and then I moved to the medical campus, still in academic computing. I worked part time for twelve years um, to uh, start having my kids, my my two sons, who are now in their thirties, and so I think they're still considered young professionals. Uh, and I, I think my favorite times at Yale were when I was at the medical campus. And what I loved about it was that. The problems were tangible and concrete, and you would talk with leadership and you'd talk with faculty and you'd say, what do you want? And they would say, this is what I want. How much will it cost? And you'd tell them and they'd say, yes, no, or let's discuss. Um, but, you know, you could you could really you, you could really get a lot done that way. And I learned just an awful lot about technology um, and and applications of it. While I was at Yale, I had wonderful, wonderful kind of extracurricular opportunities to participate in other projects like um, working with HR, rolling out um, the first competencies based performance uh, development program. Um, and uh, our first uh, at the medical school, and I think it was the first for the university also, um, uh, assessment of administrative services. Um, We were the first to roll out project management, Um, and um, uh, I uh, was one of the evangelists to uh, get people started thinking about ITIL um, and ITSM. Um, I did a lot of projects with the library, And at one point even, and and this is actually relevant, I think, to some of the conversations we'll have. Um, I got tapped, I don't know how, to uh, be an organizational development advisor to the new VP for finance administration at Yale. Now, there was nothing in my background. I I wasn't like trained in, in OD. You know, I had a lot of projects that I worked on with HR. So I don't know where that came out uh, from, where that came from. But, it, but you know, the, the point in the connection for you all is that, you know, sometimes just showing up at your job, doing what you love to do and what you're good at, other people are watching and opportunities will come to you and, and they will very often be good fit opportunities. So, um, so that, that connects that dot. Um, and I live in Connecticut, North Haven, Connecticut. I have two sons, a stepdaughter, a three-year-old granddaughter, um, a dog and a cat, uh, and, um, just have a lot of fun in my, uh, private life. I love to hike. I am a swimmer. Um, I love to read. I've got book club tonight, uh, and, um, and just love to laugh with my husband. Uh, so, you know, we, we have a lot of really good laughs. And I think my superpower is, I figure if you ask me my superpower, you're asking me to brag a little, right? So I I decided I'm not going to be shy. Um, I think my superpower 
uh, is probably that I am what I would describe as strategically creative. And what I mean by that is I listen and you can learn so much if you just shut up and listen. I'm curious. And so when I listen, I find it interesting. And, uh, and, and you know, I follow my curiosity. I always want to know where we're heading, right? What are we trying to accomplish with this? Whenever I get something new, I'm like, okay, you know, where are we heading? And knowing where we're heading, what problem we're trying to address, I tend to be good at putting things together, opportunities, new data points and the like, adjusting, even adjusting sometime, you know, the, the goal um, to take action. Uh, and um, it, it also means that I know who I want to become. And I want to become someone who is wise and kind and happy. So that's me. Thank you, Susan. I can't think of a better person to be leading the Educause Top 10 than a strategic creative mind like yours, well, which fun. makes me even more excited to dive into today's episode. But before we do that, I would like to ask Joseph to please introduce himself. Same questions. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I am Joseph Caudill. I work at the University of Notre Dame. I am an HR service delivery developer, which means that I work on improving the employee experience um, using the uh, ServiceNow platform, but in particular, really focusing on how do we bring people into their roles at Notre Dame? How do we help people get the things done that they need with HR? And how do we make all of that less painful than it would be if they were just emailing people? And so that's that's what I focus a lot of my work on. Um, that's why I'm actually not at home right now. I'm in Las Vegas for the Knowledge Conference this year. I'll be speaking tomorrow. Really excited about that. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just a great opportunity to help make the employee experience better at Notre Dame. And Susan, the, the mention of sort of doing the things that you love is what actually led me to this role is I've always had a deep interest in improving, improving employee experience and uh, leadership did take notice of that. And they're like, well, you, you could yeah. make a good fit for this role. Why don't you talk to our, uh, our group about that? And that's, that's eventually, essentially how I got where I am right now. And it's, it's been a great, a great place for me um, to really work on things that I care deeply about and use technology to do it. I've been at the university for about seven years now. Um, and I've been working in technology for just uh, like a dozen years now. It's hard for me to believe, uh, you know, as a young professional, um, <laughs> my association with uh, Educause is largely through the uh, young Professionals Community Group. I've been co-chair for, uh, I think, coming up on three years now. So, um, yeah, really great opportunity to get to know other young people um, at Educause institutions and try to build up a community there as well and try to make uh, people uh, feel comfortable and happy in higher education and in technology and higher education. So, Great, great organization. Really happy to be able to lead that group. As far as superpowers, I have thought about this one a lot. Um, and I think it comes from my education. I studied philosophy um, as an undergraduate. And the particular school uh, that I really uh, fell into was uh, um, has, has a little mantra. They say, never deny, which I think is hilarious, um, <laughs> seldom affirm always distinguish. And one of the things that I really try to hone is my ability to make distinctions, right? So hmm. I don't want to flat out deny that somebody is saying something that I think is um, incorrect. There's always something that you can tease out of what somebody else is saying to you. And so again, Susan, you're mentioning this listening, um, just, just the ability to sort of distinguish, well, you've said this and you've said that, I think there's some common ground here or uh, you know, you think that you disagree completely. Let's let's talk about where we do agree and and figure out what what we might be able to come out of uh, with this. So, yeah, making distinctions and distinguishing often is, I think, my superpower. So, well, thank you. I think these are both incredible superpowers to have on the show today, especially for this topic. So, Joseph, again, can't have can't think of a better person to make some distinctions for the Educause Top Ten today. 
Um, so before we dive in, maybe just to set the stage a little bit, I'll, I'll ask a question to you, Susan. Of course, we have young professional listeners who are our primary target, but of course, this is really meant for the full Educause community. And I personally have been reading your Educause Top 10, formerly Top 10 Issues, for, you know, decades. It's it's really been a foundational document. I think it informs a lot of what we do in higher education, technology, and beyond. But for folks who haven't been reading that or may not be familiar, I'd love for you to just give us kind of a really quick synopsis of what it is and what the goal of the Educause Top 10 program is. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the Educause Top 10 is um it's a listicle right? <laughs> who doesn't love a listicle right you know i want to see what, what those numbers are um but what they are is they are our best effort um working with the higher education community and the educators community to uh, look a little bit further in the future you know maybe just around the corner and to summarize the most important strategic issues that higher education is facing and that tech and and how technology can help address them so um, this was a change that that we made a few years ago and uh i made it really because i had been listening to uh to folks and and there were a couple of people on the on the panel who um were you know among the people i i really highly highly respect um john campbell and um oh i'm blanking out on his name um doesn't matter um but they you know i i i circled back after the after the work was done and i said to the whole panel you know tell me tell me you know what recommendations you have for us to improve the product and and in particular um they said joel hartman um i knew it would come to me if i stopped you know trying to trying to figure it out. Um, they said, you know, it's okay, but it's not really very strategic. And um, this, this really won't resonate with my institution's leadership. And so I said, can I talk to you a little bit more? So I did. And they said, you know, really what you might want to think about is figuring out what are the top issues in higher education and then going to the panel and saying, how are we going to address those? So, so, um, so I started to do that. And the way the, the the way we work is we uh, invite folks from all through our, our membership uh, to um, and and we look for people who have a record of involvement with Educause so that they kind of have a sense of what they might be in for and we kind of have a sense that um, you know they'll they'll be committed to the project. Uh, and we ask them if they'll be willing to serve on the top 10 panel. Um, we let them know, here's the work that you'll be doing. Here's about how many hours and, you know, when it's going to happen throughout the year. But one of the first things that we ask them to do is to introduce us to a leader at their institution whom we can interview, a senior leader, you know, ideally president, provost, CBO. Uh, and so we, we interview these leaders, you know, usually two dozen, 30 different leaders, for half an hour and we ask them please put try to put your head in next year uh and what are the most strategic issues problems challenges that you're going to be addressing and we ask them a few other questions but you know we say to them we really want to hear your perspective one another question we ask is where do you see higher education going over the next five years or so a little bit longer and what does technology going? What is technology going to need to do at your institution to help you prepare for it? So then we get all that um, and um, uh, get the transcripts and summarize the, the the data, do content analysis on it, um, extract particular uh, uh, verbatim comments that the leaders made, and give the IT issues panel um, a document that says. Here are, here are the priorities that your leaders mentioned. We, we de-identify them so that people won't, you know, maybe be biased um, in favor of or against or, you know, anything like that. And, and really to encourage them to step back and think about the field overall. And we also uh, highlight for them the issues that 30% or more of the leaders mentioned. 
Um, and then we put the panel to work with a, a couple of exercises to get them to say, okay, these are the, the big things that our leaders are, are facing and worrying about. Uh, you know, one might be affordability for students. And, and then we ask them to uh, ideate about how technology can help address that issue. So it always starts with a higher education issue, but then leads right into what can hire, what, what can IT do um, for that? And that, and then um, we work with the panel to refine the issues, narrow them down a little bit. And then we send out in the summer a survey to our members and ask them to prioritize those issues. And what we come out with is the top 10 uh, for the next year. We go back, we interview the panelists uh, we, and about those issues, and we ask them a few questions. And that forms the basis of the talk that I give at the annual conference, the article that I write, and a commitment that I make to the, to the leaders and the panelists, to the leaders I say that what you tell me is off the record, we will de-identify it. If we ever want to come back and quote you or anything, we will. But, you know, you will, you will know. So we're not going to, you know, misspeak on your behalf or, or share anything that you're not comfortable with our sharing. We say the same thing to the panelists, but we also say to the panelists, you will see the write-up of the article. Your name will be listed as an author for anything that we interviewed you on. And so we want to make sure that you are comfortable with what we write. Uh, and different years, like I, I think in COVID, things got a little dark. Uh, I was getting a little dark. And so my initial intro to the article was quite dark. And the panel were, was like, no, don't go, <laughs> right? And so I said, okay. And I went back and, and I revised it. But, you know, that gives you a sense. I think that that was the, the biggest change. But it gives you a sense of this really is a dialectic between um, uh, me and the panel, but also the members, right? right. Um, so maybe that makes it a trialectic. I don't know. Um, but, um, but, but, you know, it, 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 it really is an effort to reflect back to the community and summarize and, and help them see. Uh, and, uh, and, and what we want is we want this to be relevant to people and we've gotten feedback that you all use it. Um, in your strategic planning that, that, you know, some of you share it with the senior leadership. In fact, one, pe one person um, last year, uh, um, I think one of the issues was hiring resilience, recruiting and retaining IT talent under adverse circumstances. And a couple of people said, I'm going to take out the IT talent. I'm just going to say talent because this is relevant for my whole institution. And I want, you know, I, that's the level at which I want to work it um, as, as a leader. So, so, you know, you can make the list your own and do with it what you want. A lot of folks will use that, um, the, the list at their annual IT retreats. Um, and then, you know, another, another way that we've evolved over, over the years is that um, year before last, I, I, I started to get feedback and I started to pick up on the fact that people were like, this is too strategic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and I want to know what to do about it, right? So what I did last year was we added questions to the survey and we said, is there anything that you're doing related to this issue that you're particularly excited about that you might be willing to share with higher ed? And we got all kinds of, of, of you know, suggestions and, and stories and the like. And so did very light editing on that and published a whole long section of the article that we called From Strategy to Practice. Um, to help people give them ideas, because that's one of the things that we've learned is that, yeah, you know, you want the thought leadership, uh, you know, you want like, what are the, like the big themes and everything. But what you really value the most is examples of what people are doing and how to do it. So, you know, hopefully, we're, we're, we're always trying to optimize this product. So I answered the question that you asked in a little bit more, didn't I? I was just going to say, you've you've just answered so many of our questions already, which I think is helpful. It's a great introduction. I know this is a, a massive lift and a huge community engagement exercise at the minimum. So thank you for kind of giving us that really robust overview. Um, 
And I'm a little curious, I'll, I'll ask my question to Joseph now too, because Joseph serving in his capacity as a co-lead of the YPCG, he has the privilege of engaging with so many new folks working in higher education, so many young professionals working in higher education who are just chomping at the bit to try to figure out, well, how do I get engaged? How do I learn more about what's happening, not only at my institution, but higher education overall? And what do I do with it? So I'm curious, Joseph, from your lens, you know, how you might be using the Educause Top 10, either in your personal work with the YPCG or beyond, and maybe kind of what you're doing with it right now. Yeah, I think um, I think the top 10 provides a really great lens for understanding the broader sort of landscape. Um, I mean, Susan talked about the methodology uh, pretty, pretty clearly there, that it, it really does capture what a lot of our senior leaders are thinking about. And, and for young professionals, I think, um, especially people who are new to higher ed, um, it can be confusing how decisions are made or why certain strategic priorities are chosen. Um, and something like the top 10 can really explain a lot of how those decisions are being made, mm-hmm. right? Um, I mentioned my involvement with our HR group and the focus on employee experience uh, a lot of that is explained by a number of items in the top 10 from this past year that we really do have to focus on uh, employee retention, institutional resiliency, and uh, sort of what is going to keep the people that keep our institutions running happy. And uh, that's that's one of the things that I think a lot about is like the work that I do on a day-to-day basis, it might feel like it's just, you know, configuring a form or a case workflow or something, but end of the day, it it really is sort of essentially tied to some of these biggest issues in higher ed. Um, And and being able to do that with your own work can also uh, help with uh, seeing how your work ties into the mission of your institution, the mission of higher education in general, um, and you can do this all throughout um, any area of, of higher ed, uh, IT, and really just higher education in general, right? Is, is, um, and one of the things that I talk about with other young professionals, people that I meet through the community group, is sort of trying to find the way to, to make that connection, right? Because um, in many ways, working in higher education is a very mission-driven uh, sort of career, right? And and being able to make that connection back to why you're at the institution and why the institution you're at exists in the first place um, is very important. And using a tool like the top 10 is a great way to, to maintain that connection and also help help you think more strategically about your own work, um, which leadership will notice, right? If, if you are able to tie yourself back to strategic purpose on a regular basis, that's something that that is is very valuable in any member of an institution. That is, Joseph. I just want to put in a little anecdote and a story before I, I turn things over to Wes, because I know he has some great questions queued up. Um, I'm, I'm going to just share like a, a young professional story with the Educause Top 10. And I'm having like a great full circle moment, Susan, because I feel like I've wanted to share this with you for like, honestly, almost a decade. But when I was, maybe this was, this actually was almost a decade ago, I was working in a help desk and seeing so many opportunities for improvement and so many things that we could do or change or tweak. And just, I was filled with the kind of like optimism of, well, what can we do? What might we do? How might we do this? And the student help desk at the time was run by students, all student, all student labor. So it was a lot of energy, a lot of fun, a lot of buzzing, and everyone wanted to do something. And we all have been learning so much in our respective areas. So there's just so much kind of just creativity, strategic creativity oozing out. Um, and I remember, um, I wrote a proposal to our director at the time of user services. So we were a help desk among, gosh, maybe 
like six different verticals reporting up to the user services umbrella. And I wrote a proposal to our director for an idea I had to establish kind of a student leadership team to start really bringing those ideas together and start doing something about them, pulling together a small team to start just taking action and, and piloting some potential projects or ideas. And I had never met our director. I barely knew his name, <laughs> but I wrote something and I felt really nervous, but I sent it to him. And lo and behold, he replied and he asked to get lunch with me. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in our student help desk and he came down the three levels because he was way at the top and he came down and walked into our help desk to come kind of grab me to walk over for lunch. And I remember feeling like, wow, this this person really is listening and heard me. But as part of my proposal development, I did a lot of research to see, well, what are people saying? How do I know what I'm even talking about? Is this a thing? And I remember stumbling upon Echocause content and mm. some of that ended up being top 10, other articles related to the top 10, other things that you have written and other folks in Echocause have written and who I'm friends with now to this day. So it was one of those really kind of fun opportunities where I had no idea that reading this content, seeing something that was more strategic focused and aligning my ideas with it could be an answer to, you know, uh, solving a problem. And the, the outcome of, of that proposal was me getting a job on the leadership team, working for this director, doing some of the things I proposed, namely what I'm most proud of was establishing a student leadership council for the entire department. Um, so that was like one of those beautiful outcomes, but I share that because the top 10 and resources from Educause really are an, an opportunity for people to do things with it. And so maybe with that, I'll turn it over to Wes to see kind of how he wants to follow up the lines of questioning, but it's just, it's been a really um, great opportunity to be able to share that um, story with you, Susan. So thank you. Oh, thank <laughs> you. That's a wonderful story. Yeah. yeah. Excellent story, especially for a fellow help desk uh, worker. Yes. So shout out to you. Represent. <laughs> Represent. So Susan, you know, particularly because we're, we're normally talking to young professionals, right? And kind of like what Joseph mentioned earlier, uh, higher ed careers are mission driven in a lot of ways. And as someone just coming in, there's usually like 20 missions. If you look up strategic plans, there's the campus one, there's your administrative unit one, there's your org one, your team might have one. And then you also have this Educause top 10 and a couple other things. So as someone coming in that's hitting the ground, they're they, they got a narrow field of view. They want to do more. They want to get noticed. They want to be more strategic, but they have no idea how because they're just taking calls at the desk, right? But they want to figure it out. What is it that you would want that young professional to take from the Educause top 10? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would like them to read it. <laughs> and I would like them, uh, you know, I'd like to say, you know, and, and, and I would also like them to sort of follow it as their interest is peaked. So there is that whole from strategy to practice section, right? And that may help get get them crashing on some of these big ideas and, you know, to have them think, well, gee, you know, like um, uh, number 10 is cultivating institutional agility, Um or, uh, you know, one is cybersecurity as a core competency or whatever. Um, and I'm getting all these calls at the help desk about, you know, cybersecurity and the like. And, and I read, you know, the, the advice there and um, it, it made me think, you know, that, that, that maybe we should do more training or, or something. You know, it made me understand the extent to which our users are... Um, uh, the biggest vector and, and, uh, you know, for, for uh, cybersecurity issues, but then also, you know, the, the, the best way to actually safeguard the institution. And maybe I want to suggest to, um, you know, my help desk folks that, that I, you know, do some in-service training of the help desk staff, right? So that they become a little bit more aware of cybersecurity issues and, and things like that. Cause that way, when, when you're, when you're working with somebody on the help desk, um, I mean, you know that they'll tell you their problem and your first job is to figure out 
what their problem really is, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so you have these wonderful conversations with the people you support, and it gives you opportunities to maybe influence them, to maybe learn a little bit more and, and share back. So I think that those opportunities to kind of get that, that wider perspective on your field are really, really helpful because, um, you know, being a young professional is just this wonderful time of life because there are so that your, your paths are still forking, right? And, and you have so many, maybe some days, and I'm at the other end of my career where I've taken those forked paths, right? Um, and it's led me hopefully, you know, out of the maze, right? Um, but but you know, a lot of those those maybe some days and those possibilities have have really shut down in ways I'm perfectly comfortable, you know, with. So I don't I'm like not, oh, it sucks to be old. It's cool to be old. It's cool to be any age, right? But you should be the age, you should understand where you are in life and what the possibilities are. And as a young professional, you have an enormous amount of possibilities. And you also have constraints right? Everybody has constraints in their lives. But but what you want to do is, I think as a young professional and with these issues of the help desk is, you kind of want to understand what your boundaries are, right? And, and, and the way you can do that is test them a little bit, right? So, you know, figure out like, where does this get me thinking? How can I help make this a better help desk? How can I, how can I learn and grow as a professional? How can I help the users, how can I, or, you know, whatever you call them these days, constituents, clients, um, whatever, right? Um, but also, how can I learn and grow? How can I help my colleagues? And that might give you some ideas. And, and you know, you may get to a point where, like Sarah, you're like, I want to make this suggestion. And so Sarah did a bunch of things right. You know, she, she wrote it down. She did her research. Because a lot of times when you have a great idea, you do your research and you find out, oh, people have already solved this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't the first to come across it. This is just the first time I, but that, that like saves you from wasting a lot of energy, right? Um, yeah. But you also, you know, and then you share it with your boss and, and you show your boss, I know how to think. I know how to figure my way through a problem. Um, I know how to convince myself and therefore your boss um, why this is a problem and 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 also what you can do about it because you know one of the things you learn early in your career hopefully is don't come with a problem until you can also come with a solution right because it's just like such a pain I, I, tr I I'm I, I'm actually you know usually pretty okay about it but but, you know, if somebody says, this is a real problem, then, you know, I like go right into, uh-oh, how am I going to solve it for you? Um, right? Um, versus, hey, you know, I have some thoughts about this. But, but anyway, you know, throughout this, you're going to be building your, your, your critical skills. You're going to be building, you know, your networks. And then it really is important to build your network, both within your institution, within your department, um, and, and that is just uh, so, so important. But find those opportunities to start to build your professional network more broadly. And I know the professional um, uh, you know, dollars are very, very limited and that um, you know, maybe it's once every four or five years that anybody you know, who's, who's early in the career can go to a, an in-person conference. Um, see if there are local opportunities that you can find, you know, things within, within your institution, but also webinars, um, you know, get involved in Educause community groups because Educause community groups are abundant um, and they're free and they, they really are where you can, you can meet your peers and you can have an impact too. So I, I've kind of wondered, is there, um, was there anything else, <laughs> else that I should have answered with this? No, that was a, a great, a great answer, Susan. So, so thank you for that. Um, you know, I'll add to that plus a million to everything that you just said. Also add to one of the things that I've shared with my staff in the past, particularly when I was at the help desk, which tends to be very much young professional entry level roles, yeah. is one of the beautiful things I see in strategic plans is 
they quite literally tell you where your top level folks are thinking or wanting to go. And you can roadmap that to your career. A lot of the folks who come in to uh, higher education, IT, they don't actually know exactly what they want to do. Right. They just know they want to work in IT or they just want a stable job or they want a mission-driven uh, working environment, whatever that is. But they don't actually know what specifically they want to do. So there have been times where I've been in meetings where I've pulled out not just the Educos top 10, but my university's plan, my department's plan and said, all right, well, here's the three areas our CIOs focus on for the next three to five years. Which one's most interesting to you? And let's get you trained up for that. Um, so even beyond just pushing forward the mission, it's like an opportunity to push your own brand and self forward, particularly if you don't know what exactly you want to do. So I just wanted to add that in there as a plus to everything you just said. Oh, you know, that's really, really true. And your CIO it probably loves you for that because nothing's more depressing than a strategic plan that nobody can remember or nobody. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> okay. It's the excellent strategic plan right there. Yes. <laughs> on one page. Yeah. Yeah. One page is yeah. 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 a great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so Susan, how, how, how long has Educos been making the top 10 list? I know it's had different titles, but how, how far back are we talking? Oh, gosh. You know, I think um, we may be coming up on the, uh, for as long as Educos has, has been in existence, I think, you know, over 20 years. Um, you know, the, we're, we're probably approaching the, the 25th anniversary and it has always been an evolving product. So um, when I got the job at Educause, it, it was a newly created position and a newly created area. And my boss brought in things that had been, you know, in other parts of Educause, including what was called, I think it was called current issues at the time. Um, and at the time it had been uh, led by by my dear colleague, Catherine Yang, who's now Educause Vice President for Digital Communications and Content. And she, had, she, you know, really from the start, she worked with a, a, a group of members, but the group of members actually wrote it and they picked the issues. And, and, and we really did need to evolve from that. Um, partly, you know, I, I put the research spin on it, but also partly because one of the things that we see is that as you all get busier and more stressed and have more to do than you've got, you know, headcount to do, you have less time to contribute to your profession. So um, one of the things that we are really trying to do is to uh, help make your experiences contributing to the profession at Educause as efficient and rewarding as possible. So, you know, we don't ask you to write stuff anymore because there's a lot of people with fabulous ideas who choke when it comes to writing, right? But they're so eloquent when you talk to them. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, we, we really try to take, we try to say, what can we do that they don't need to do? And what do we need them for? Um, so, so, yeah, it's been around for a long time. Thank you for that. And I'm, I'm curious. So it's been around for dang near over two decades, it seems like. Yeah. Has there been any particular topics over that time frame that stood out to you and that's continued for most of the time you've been doing or working on the top team? Well, you know, there's always something about money, um, whether <laughs> it's budget or funding models or this or that. And, you know, my tip for, you know, any any professional uh, is follow the money because if things don't make sense, decisions don't make sense and choices don't make sense to you, you know, if you figure out where the money's coming from, it's amazing how much sense they will suddenly start to make. Um, and so, you know, there's always something, generally always something about money. There's very often something about the workforce, about staffing. Um, there's There's something about um, about ed tech, academic technology students, and, you know, those issues change over time. Um, but, you know, that, that is, that is a thread going through, um, uh, another thread I think is, you know, the, the workforce, um, re recently, 
Um, you know, to, to me, it's still recent that cybersecurity is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when, you know, you know at, at Yale, we said, oh, we have to bring in somebody to lead in that. Then we called it information security, um, you know, and, and so that was like a new thing and we gave it part time to somebody. But, but, you know, since then, like cybersecurity, just we, we can't not have it um, near the top of the top 10 mm -hmm. for, you know, very, very important reasons. Um, you know, some issues come and go uh, and, and even, you know, even though those are really big categories. So, you know, you dive deeper into the categories and that really tells you the story of, of what is happening. Enrollment is a great example of an issue that was not on the top 10 until about four or five years ago. Uh, yeah. And, you know, that's because all of a sudden, you know, people did see enrollments start to soften. And it was, you know, right. I think it, it, it's no coincidence that it was, you know, around the time that student debt really became mm -hmm. what we now know mm -hmm. it to be a crisis. And, um, uh, and, and so people said, I can't afford this. Um, also when, you know, certain voices in our society started to, um, uh, evangelize against higher education, um, and, and, you know, to try to defund it, uh, so that it wouldn't work as well as it as it needs to, you know, there is definitely some some cause and effect uh, going on there, I think. Um, and uh, and and, you know, people, um, it, you know, describing higher education as elitist and excessively liberal and, and the like. And, you know, certainly there is. There is that thread, um, and certainly, um, uh, you know, as somebody whose politics tend to be, you know, liberal, I know that, um, you know, that I've uh, that 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 is one of the um, the flat sides of, uh, you know, I'm smart and I'm proud of it, right? And you're not, and you know, so there. I guess maybe it's the revenge of the nerds or something like that. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> way, way off topic, but um, but but you know that they, they're you know uh, the, these sort of societal issues have have really grown. I think in the top ten, as mm. higher education has gotten kind of higher stakes and and also become more influential. You know, just mm. I, I like I saw with with my own institution, Yale. Um, I doubt I could get admitted into Yale um, as as a graduate student now. Uh, because you just have to be absolutely extraordinary, you know, <laughs> and there's a lot of really extraordinary people out there. It is, it is really kind of cool and amazing. Um, but, but, you know, higher education, particularly the elites have become more powerful and power attracts, attracts criticism um, and, mm -hmm. and detractors. So. That's fair. And uh, Susan, uh, Based off your superpower intro, I would admit you in the yell if that counts for anything here today. <laughs> so I got one more question if y'all entertain me. Uh, this one's for uh, Joseph. So Joseph, in a in a previous episode, we had some guests on. I think it was our Educause, at Educause episode. And we talked about how it was shared during that episode that sometimes young professionals tend to only get tapped for like the future facing problems. So like if it's a new technology, there's an assumption that young professionals, out of y'all know technology, you grew up with technology. So you're the one I assigned for the future stuff. With, with that in mind, what would you say to young professionals that were looking to find ways to like push forward the Educause top 10, which as Susan just shared, some of these issues carry 20 years of legacy on the top 10. So they're not just future facing technology. It's just, hard institutional problems like cost. What role do you see young professionals playing in, in furthering those efforts, finding new ways to tackle those efforts, whatever it is? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, this is something that we often will even do to ourselves. Well, you know, we're young professionals, so let's talk about the, the new technology. And sure, that's a thing that you can do. Um, but as Susan mentioned, there's all of these different sort of categories into which these problems fall. And if you uh, go back and give it another listen, the thing that I was hearing throughout this was, this is like just how institutions work, right? Like somebody has to worry about the money, 
Somebody has to worry about enrollment. Somebody has to worry about employee experience. Somebody has to worry about technology. And so if you came to technology in higher ed because you really care about technology, sure, keep focusing on the technology and where you can push things. But if you came to technology in higher ed because uh, you, you care about enrollment and ed tech, like there's a place for you for that. If you care about the finances, there's a place for you for that. And like focusing on how this tool uh, sort of parses out some of the bigger problems in those areas is a great way as a young professional to insert yourself into those conversations like Sarah did earlier in her career where she was able to use these sorts of tools and inform herself on what are people at the highest levels thinking about um, and then making yourself a more valuable member of whatever space you want to see yourself in, right? It, a lot of people will talk about sort of this, this need to be self-directed and finding the work that you want to do. And sometimes it can come off as a like, well, you've made it already, you know what you want to do. But the people who make it, typically that's how you make it, right? Is you find the thing that really drives you and you invest in yourself to be better at that. And in so doing, you make your institution better in that space as well. So I think, yeah, sure, if you want to focus on the, the student experience because you are a recent graduate, right? Great, mm -hmm. use that to your advantage. Um, and like, keep in mind, you're gonna get further away from that student experience as you grow in your career and continue going back to the people who will know more. You might be interested in the technology. Great, that's fine. Or you might be like me and like, I don't, I don't really care so much about the tech. I care about the experience for the people I work with. Or I care about what it looks like for the instructors or whatever it is, right? The finances. I find the finances fascinating. Um, I don't have the financial background to really dive into that. But, you know, it's, it's a thing that uh, you need to be able to understand how that money's flowing and and what is driving decisions. So that's, that's how I would counsel other young professionals to approach something like this, right? Don't pigeonhole yourself into the young professional spaces because we're just other professionals who happen to be younger and at the earlier end of our career, which actually opens us up to way more possibilities because we haven't made some of those uh, decision branching uh, choices. So, yeah, oh, that's, that's great. Can I, I two yeah, other please. things that, yeah, yeah. That, that this, uh, that this makes me think of, um, and one is, um, that I would really, um, and, and encourage you, uh, um, and, and this is the, the sooner you can learn this lesson, the better, but it's really a lesson you have to learn and relearn and relearn your whole life. Um, uh, when like about, I don't know, 20 years ago, maybe more than that, I was um, part of part, part of part of a, a, you know, a group of professionals at, at in IT support, because that's where I was um, uh, at, at the Ivy Plus institutions. And we got together a couple of times a year. And one of them, uh, it, you know, as, as, it, as a part time gig, he was doing um, uh, Stephen Covey seven habits training. And so over dinner one night, he was telling me all about it. And I said, that's really, really interesting. And I learned more about it. And I actually had him come and train, uh, put, put the whole IT support uh, group through a Seven Habits workshop. And people loved it. They just loved it. And, and that has really been, you know, one of the things I've learned more lessons from that. But one of the one of the concepts from that that I think is really helpful is a concept called circle of concern and circle of influence. And the notion is, what are the things that you really have influence and control over? And then what are all the things that, you know, you're you're bothered about, interested in, concerned about, but you don't really have any influence over? And and the first thing is. Can you tell the difference? Do you know the difference? So start to understand the difference. And if you really try to focus your energy um, uh, in your circle of influence, your circle of influence will over time just tend to grow. 
because that's where you can actually get things done. But there's a lot of times in our lives and, and in a lot of people who find themselves really more in that circle of concern all the time, all the time. Um, and, and, and that's really where you, you, you are limiting things. So then especially um, if you are trying to maybe get something done, uh, influence, right? The, those higher, uh, the, those higher ups or, or whatever, do it from your circle of influence and, you know, really do your homework like Sarah did, you know, come up with something that is feasible, um, you know, state the problem, do your research, everything else. Um, so, you know, I would really suggest that. And then my other piece of advice is that, um, life is, it's developmental. Now, I happen to have my PhD in developmental psychology. So of course, you know, I might think that, but it just really is remarkable to me how the things that bother you, the things that you're passionate about, where you want to put your energy um, are so often a factor of where you are in your life, um, but also where you are in, you know, your mental, emotional development and maturity and um, so like, there's a whole bunch of things that you care about right now that I don't care about at all anymore, right? <laughs> and it's, but there's a whole bunch of things I care about that you don't. And, and it really is developmental. So if you like worry about what is it going to be like, you know, like 15 years from now, blah, blah, blah. Don't worry, you'll be ready for it, right? Um, and, but it's also advice for people of my generation to remember that not everybody's at this point in their life, in their career, and we have to meet people where they are. Uh, and you are in a, a wonderful, high energy, special time of your career. You really are the future of our world. You're the future of, of your institution. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it is, it is so important and I'm so grateful that you are part of Educause. And, um, and, you know, please, please know that I'm always eager to, you know, hear from you, um, you know, and, and it might be, hey, can you help me figure out how to do something? Or it might be, you know, I don't see myself in this. And here's some thoughts about how I could or, you know, whatever. But I think that if you understand that we're all on, we're all on our journey, um, we're in different, we're kind of on different journeys very often, but at different points in that journey. And if you can just have respect um, at, and an appreciation of that fact, I think you'll get a better sense of how to relate to leadership and how to have those conversations. And, um, and hopefully, you know, leadership and others will, will get a sense for how to involve you because it's critical. Wow. Well, I think that is a mic drop right there. A beautiful place to, to end this uh, amazing conversation. So thank you both, Susan and Joseph, for joining us. Clap it up. I think this was a great episode. We're honored to have y'all. Uh, Su uh, Sarah, any final words? Or are we ready to close this thing out? Thank you. We're ready to close this thing out. We had two mic drops, one from Susan and Joseph. Thank you both so much for your insights and just sharing your wonderful perspectives and advice for all of our listeners, including us. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And I want to point you. out real quick for the end that I, I caught that Joseph literally used his superpower in our last question. <laughs> I just wanted to call that to attention. I don't know if we've seen that one yet. He used the red laser eyes in the middle of the conference. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah. Thank <laughs> it you. just comes out. Can't help it. <laughs>